Jesus. I'm just going to talk to you tonight about foundations of healing. Foundations of healing. And it's not just healing, though. It is... Uh, she's... My daughter again. I don't know what this is. But anyway... It's winter. Good night, Kevin. You too. Okay, foundations of healing. Um, thank you, Father, for your help tonight. Thank you for this brief time we can be together that, that you'll help us hear and be healed. Hear and receive in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I was listening to Brother Hagin the other day and he was talking about, now he used to do, he would teach in the morning at Rama. He would teach, in the Rama was from 9 in the morning, or maybe sometimes 8.30 until uh, 12 noon. And, uh, and then they let us out. Um, and we, many of us had jobs and stuff. And, but he would go and teach in healing school. Uh, every day he would teach in healing school. And... Uh, and that was one of the places to be. But see, I had, I, uh, I had uh, a job, I had to work, and, uh, and that we needed that, so uh, I didn't get a chance to go a lot there. But uh, we, we partook, in, and he taught a lot of us, you know, during the classes. Every time we had a class, he taught, you know, he, oh, every time he had us open our Bibles to Mark 11, 23. Uh, Mark eleven twenty two, Mark eleven twenty three, Mark eleven twenty four, Mark eleven twenty five, and all those. That was the source of his. Uh, that's where he learned faith was in those scriptures right there. He was on his deathbed. He was sixteen years of age. He was given up by medical science to die. The doctor basically, uh, you know, and the preacher. The preacher wasn't any better than the doctor. Really, the doctor, you know, kind of just. Uh, uh, they did everything they could to help him, and then, uh, and then uh, the preacher just said, "What you want to do is just uh, stay in the middle of the road and be ready to go." That was kind of a thing. They they did not believe in healing. Um, so anyway, in, in healing, if you go uh, to uh, Proverbs chapter eighteen, we're going to look at some scriptures, and and uh, then we're going to take communion. Um, I was trying to, uh, we'll do communion right now. Uh, I was trying to, you know, accommodate Natalie. And uh, she, she uh, Jada is leaving early in the morning tomorrow to go to Hawaii. And uh, they're picking her up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're going to pray for her right now. Father, we just thank you for... For, for your favor on, on Jada and her, her grandmother and, uh, and the flights and everything, Father. Actually, it's the flight from Boston go nonstop into Honolulu. It's a 12-hour flight. <laughs> Hallelujah. We just thank you for favor and good weather and everything, good flights in Jesus' name. And safe travels and safe time while they're there. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, thank you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> when we hold the bread in your hand and, and you are coming in touch with the greatest expression of his love, you know, what's, what, what is going on here, much of the church world uh, did not really totally understand somewhat recent, you know, back in the day, the book of Acts, after... They, they took communion every day. They went from house to house breaking bread and having communion together. And, uh, and when they, people began to look into the communion, because tradition gets in pretty quick in certain circles, you know, and they just kind of get into a traditional thing 
of doing communion a certain way. But when you begin to really investigate and look at what's going on, you know, the Bible talks about he would prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. See, this table is the communion table. And when we take communion, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. This is in the face of all adversity of the spirits that are around us. You know, we, we come together in a place like this and we worship God and we bring in the presence of God. The Bible says the, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So that's when we pray, praising and worshiping God, God comes and inhabits those praises. That's why the presence of God comes in. But, uh, but when we leave this place, you know, we're going to be confronted with things, you know, in, in, in not an aggressive way. You know, the enemy is, you know, he's kept back the presence of God in your life, the power of God in your life. And, you know, the gospel is the power of God. You know, this is, and uh, to the Jew first and also to the, the Gentile. And, but uh, we get home and uh, we do whatever we do and we get into bed and stuff. But, you know, there may be thoughts battling you or whatever sometimes. And so when we're, we're, we're uh, a table is prepared in the presence of the enemies, the enemies are outside these doors. I mean, we're in the world that we're, we, we walk out there, but there's a presence of God that goes with us. But we're proclaiming to those entities what they already know. Their time's up. <laughs> and they know their future. And yes, yeah, yes, yeah, not bright. And so, uh, so when we... When we hold the bread in our hands and coming in touch with the greatest expression of his love, when we come to realize what he, is, he has done and how what he's doing is this, he has this delivery system for us, the life of God, the Zoe life of God, to be an exchange here. Um, we come and receive the elements here that are representing certain aspects of his sacrifice, the body and the blood. And as we take them in faith in Jesus' name, the broken body is for our, our healing, the bread. He is the bread of life. He says that in John chapter, John chapter 6 is a great chapter to go over. And especially the last two-thirds of that chapter. It, he says it over and over again. And you can see it's, it's, it's affecting the Jews that are there with him. And many of them are leaving. And he doesn't cool it off. He doesn't, you know, bring it down a notch. He actually ratchets it up. And, uh, and then he comes to Peter, James, and his disciples, and he said, are you two going to leave? And because leave, people were leaving him. They did not understand. They didn't inquire. They, see, that's the secret. When you don't understand, you don't, it's not when you walk away. You don't, you don't walk away when you don't understand. You press in. You press in, and you decide to make a decision. I'm going to learn. I'm going to see this i'm gonna i'm gonna receive this in jesus name see it's all about faith and so this love made him endure the cruel stripes on his back caused him to subject his body to be beaten bruised and broken so yours can be made whole and when we partake and celebrate release our faith to receive his health wholeness in exchange for his sickness, for, our, for the, the things that we are dealing with in our bodies. And when we exchange, he gives us his life, his Zoe life, through these elements. Hallelujah. The remission, this, the blood, you know, this is, uh, 
we, we, we use a, a type of grape juice, I think, here, but, uh, you know, we've had to use wine at times or whatever because we didn't have, and it's all right, you can do that. Um, if wine was wrong to use in communion, you know, then Jesus was participating in something that wasn't right. He's the one. His mother came to him and said, listen, they run out of wine. And he goes, why are you coming to me? I have, I have no direction on this. He said, he says, I only do what I see my father do, and I only say what I hear my father say. Well, he had, hadn't any direction when she came to him, but it was still his mother. And it tells you how the, the favor she had with Almighty God. Now, she wasn't deity, and she's not to be worshipped, but she had great favor with God, her father. And when she comes to Jesus and says what she says, and he says, um, kind of like, I have no direction. It is not my time. But she doesn't repeat herself. She doesn't argue. She just tells the guys that were with, uh, with her, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Trust me. And then walks away. She doesn't stay there and fuss with him. Like, I'm your mother. You do what I tell you to do. No. She says her piece and walks away. She's trusting. And, 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 and then he got direction. Her faith made it happen. And... Uh, And the Lord tells him what to do. He says, take those water, this, the, those water pots and fill them with water. That didn't make any sense. That's why she said what she said. You know, he's going to tell you something that won't make any sense. Trust me, do it. Just do it. And, of course, he did and they did. And, and then they took the, the, they took the lentil or whatever the thing was and uh, bring it to the governor of the, of the wedding. And he tastes it and said, my word, most people save the, the good stuff, or save the, use the good stuff first. And when they get their, their taste buds a little numb, they bring out the Boone's Farm, the cheap stuff. But you save the best till last. And see, that's just like God. He saved the best. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the is the example of the new wine, and uh, and He gave that to the church. Hallelujah! Oh, I, I feel I feel so. I mean, I, I don't know how to say it. You, you kind of just you kind of grieved that part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're missing out. They don't realize. What they've embraced something that's not true, and uh, they embrace a lie, and they go without. And all the time, Jesus told the disciples on the day of Pentecost, He commanded them. Well, it was on, it was a week before, and uh, He tells them, He tells them, "Don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father." He, he command. He, and it wasn't a suggestion, it was a command. Jesus in his glorified body standing in front of 500 people on that, on that day. And, they, uh, and still there's people that find an excuse not to do it. You want to receive that. So, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among them. And so, Father, we just thank you for these, these things, the, for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by, by his stripes we were healed. So we take this in the name of Jesus and receive our healing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Hallelujah. 
the life of God, the Zoe life of God, permeates our bodies from the top of our head and the soles of our feet. We receive that in Jesus' name. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This new covenant that he and his father cut between themselves and the promises that it has. Hallelujah. The remission of sins, not the atonement, but the remission that the sin, our sin, is gone. He's taken the sin nature. He's taken and given us a whole new nature, whole new operating system. And he's taken our sin and he's cast it as far as the east is from the west. You cannot measure that. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. All the sins that we will commit before the lamb, before the catching away of the church is already forgiven. He's forgiven the future, the present, and the past. He's not holding anything against us. And as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him. In Jesus' name. He has given us the power and the authority to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, not obey the lust of the flesh. No, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we take that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, there is a story about a woman with an issue of blood. This is a kind of a woman's situation. She is, it says here, if we go to Mark, chapter 5, verse 25, and it says, A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse not a good situation and when she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment for she said if I may touch but his clothes I shall be whole And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? This is Jesus now. But still, see, he wasn't operating as God in his earthly ministry. He was operating as a man under the Abrahamic covenant, anointed of the Holy Ghost. And so he didn't always know everything. He was not operating as God. He was being the prototype of our ministry that he gave to us. When he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. And when Jesus ascended up into heaven on that day, uh, before Pentecost, you know, he was standing out there 40 days, hallelujah, after the Passover. And, uh, and he's speaking to the disciples, and Paul said there was over 500 of them. And that's where he told them about the Holy Ghost. You'll receive the Holy Ghost. You, you want to wait in Jerusalem. Don't leave town, but wait for the promise of the Father. And, uh, and then when he got done with his instructions, he immediately ascended up, and they were watching him go. And they had, God had to send two angels to tell him, to, what are you guys doing? You know, the same Jesus, the way he left, he's going to come back the same way. Now, go. And, uh, but, you know, he, uh, he had to go do what he had to do, and, and the disciples had to do what they had to do. Praise the Lord. 
But the woman here with the issue of blood, when you look upon it and see this thing, what she had, this had gone on for 12 years. And it says she spent, she suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had. You can imagine she was not a happy camper. She was maybe holding something against whatever kind of medical field they had back in those days. And, uh, but she had heard. Now, faith is present here, but we don't hear anything of it. We don't hear the word until verse 34. But see, the, the actions, the confessions... We see all the parts of, the, of operating in the faith of God. That's why going over this will help you understand how God's faith works. And a, a certain woman, which had this situation, verse 26, and had suffered many things of many physicians. She had gone through a lot and spent all that she had, sometimes you're going to see and figure it out that you're going to wake up before maybe she did and realize that the approach that she's taking doesn't work. Going the medical route does not work in this situation. Medicine, medicine is only, they, they can do certain things. The rest, what we do is we leave the rest up to God. And but then you got to understand how to work the work your faith. This is how you got to do it. See, you're going to see that words were spoken, and she heard them. Somebody said something to her. She heard from somebody that there's the, this man. They maybe called him Rabbi. And people were healed when they touched his garment. See, she heard about that. That's why she had faith for that. Because it goes on, it says, and had suffered many things from many physicians and spent all that she had and nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. See the situation here. And she did not quit and she did not give up, even though it, it, it appeared that it wasn't working. Verse 27, and, and it said, when she had heard, see, words were spoken that she heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going to have to hear. Brother Hagin was saying some things the other day. I was watching a, a teaching he was giving. And, uh, uh, and he said he was, he'd walk around the campus there. He would, he'd walk over after lunch. He'd walk over and do the prayer and healing. And they had a particular building. They had one built called the Prayer and Healing Center. And he would go teach healing school. They call it healing school there in the afternoon. And he was saying that one morning he went over there and went into the building and was getting ready. And he, and he heard this in his spirit. Hear and be healed. Hear and be healed. Now, he heard it three different times before he wrote it down. He's very, you know, he's very transparent. He tells you, you know, that, uh, you know, see, if you hear something like that, you know that wasn't, uh, wasn't you. You want to write it down. It took him three times to hear it. But he, but he heard, hear and be healed. And he heard it. A number of times, and then he, uh, he finally wrote it down. <clears throat> and it dawned on him what the Lord was trying to get across to him. And see, it says in verse 27, And when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. So it identifies kind of what she heard, because this is what she did. She didn't come up with this with, with, uh, on her own. And verse 28 says, for she said, she, now listen, see, words were spoken, she heard those words. Then, then she said, 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'm trying to chip this down and make it as brief as I can, but I don't want to not get the point across here. For she said, now we're going to have to say some things. We're going to have to learn to say some things that what we believe. That's why he likens to, by putting bread in your mouth, is like you're treating the spiritual side just like the physical side. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the, of the Father. What do you do with that word? You do the same thing that you do with bread. You put it in your mouth. You chew on it. And you swallow it. And when you hear the precious things of the kingdom of God, you put that in your mouth. You notice what it says right there. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. You can imagine how many times she said that. See, confession is a... Uh, Precious thing. Speaking out the word, what the word of God says, does a few things here for you. Words you speak out of your mouth. First thing it does, it locates you where your faith is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, examine yourself. To see if you're in faith. Remember, faith is the hand that reaches and takes hold of the provision that God has made for us. You don't have to whine. You don't have to cry. You don't have to plead with God. You just take the promise, make it your own, put it in your mouth, and you say it. And you say it as long as you need to say it until it comes to be a reality in your life. Okay, so faith comes by hearing. And then it says here, for she said, if I may touch. When she had heard, then she said in verse 28, the next verse, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, that's where her faith was in. It located where her faith was. And it's a good thing to locate where your faith is. You know, uh, when we were going over that little mini book, How God Taught Me Prosperity, he says, he tells us to claim something, to claim an amount that you're believing for. Well, you need to examine and see where you are, where your faith is. Now you've been, all of you have been sitting in this church for a while. And those, are we on internet? And those, out, those of you out there, some of you tune in. I don't know how often you do, that's between you and God. But see, uh, when you make a decision to go for all, everything God has, you're going to be surprised at what you're willing to do. And see, when I, when I met my wife, God put us together. And see, I had been doing certain things in this denomination that I was attending this church up in nor northern Vermont, you know, up there in uh, the city of South Burlington, Vermont. In this little double wide, uh, this little double wide mobile home, and uh, and and they were having me read these books, these thick books, 
And it was just, it wasn't anything. See, when you read Brother Hagin's book, it's not the same. They didn't, he didn't sit down and write a book. They took it from his meeting of pre, that he taught. And that anointing's in that book. It's amazing how it does that. Billy's the one that did a lot of his books. And uh, anyway, uh, so hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so, now I see where I'm at now. Uh, and see, Carolyn, uh, her mother, you know, I, I just meeting them, you know, we, we, uh, I, I met them in September. We got married in February. We moved, I moved into the house. We were living downstairs. And Mom gave me a set of Kenneth Copeland's tapes. So I began to listen to them over and over and over. I made a decision. I got, I, di I made a decision, and I was using his example. He did the same thing, him and Gloria. And so I, when I made that decision and stuck with it, I could tell there's change going on. Change was going on. And, uh, and it just kind of pulled me out of this whole thing, and anyway, it separated me. And so, um, so you have to hear the word on the promise that God has for you. You have to hear that. You have to hear that and read that and hear it taught. And, and to really to hear it, you need to hear it taught and preached, explained and proclaimed. And, uh, and then you begin to put it in your mouth. You hear it, then you put it in your mouth. You begin to say it. You make declarations over yourself. And these are things that are benchmarks in your life. And... Uh, and then, and then as you, you hear and you begin to speak more and more, it begins to really em, empowers your inner man. You begin to see the change. And, uh, um, and see, I'm going to give you a little homework. In Numbers chapter 13, um, the children of Israel were out in the wilderness, and God brought them up to a certain place called Kadesh Barnea. And, and, they, and they were told, the Lord told them, send out 12 spies to look at the land. And not to see if they could take it. That's not what God was telling them. He said, just look it over and get it, you know, and, and come back with a report. And they did. And 10 said no, and 2 said yes. And everybody got what they said. The 10 spies never got anything. They got exactly what they said they were going to get. Nothing. And then the two, Caleb and Joshua, said, let us go in at once and let us take this thing. We can do it. Well, they eventually got to do that. They actually were the two that actually, from the original group, they were the two that went into the promised land. They were the only, out of two million, it was down to two. So, hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Now, Natalie just texted me and said it's still snowing, so... Uh, uh, I'm going to let you go. Father, we just thank you right now for uh, getting everybody home safe and sound. And, uh, and uh, we thank you, Father God. And we thank you for, if there's anybody out there, you're listening, and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you can do it right now. Just call on the name of Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. And I thank you for opening my eyes and my understanding that I will see to know what to do next. And, uh, and what the Bible will teach you to do is to find a church, sit under a pastor, and he can bring you uh, up in your life spiritually. He can help you if he's, if he's really a called pastor. Uh, you don't go to just anybody, just like you don't go to just any restaurant. You find a good chef that has a reputation, and you go sit and eat there. You just don't go to some place because they put a uh, shingle out there you know we've got food doesn't mean you're, you're to eat it but anyway so and tell somebody what you did if you prayed and you asked Jesus to come and be your Lord and Savior you tell somebody what you did amen thank you Lord Jesus so hallelujah but 
Eight o'clock on the nose. Hallelujah. How far is the farthest one got to go home besides Olympia? Olympia, you're probably the farthest, right? You're going to be all right? 